Accessories After the Fact by E. Temple Thurston. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dixon, the butler, was all against these migrations to the country directly the season was over in town. He disliked the neighbourhood of Dartmoor. There were countless reasons he gave for his objections to leaving town, but the real one, to which he never alluded, was that he could not take his wig to the barber every week. Like all his sex, Dixon was vain, the vanity of most men being to conceal their vanity if they can, wherefore a man will go to immense trouble and as much expense as any woman to appear quietly turned out. To achieve that appearance of being a well-dressed gentleman who will attract the attention of none but those who know, a man will exhibit as much vanity as any woman in the world. In some manner of speaking, this was the vanity of Dixon. His master and mistress, Sir Harold and Lady Borthwick, they knew he wore a wig. Her ladyship's maid, she knew. The cook knew. Indeed, the whole household was aware of it. Yet there was his vanity. He had paid, for him, a considerable sum for that wig. It fitted him, as they say, to a T. Every week in London he took it to an expensive barber's, and, while in seclusion in an upper part of the premises, had it carefully combed and one grey hair added to its otherwise chestnut beauty. One grey hair a week, he said. This was his vanity in calculation. That's fifty-two a year. Two hundred and sixty in five years' time. In twenty years I shall be getting white about the head. Yet the only people in a position to observe these increasing signs of age were those who knew it was a wig. That is like vanity all over. In their presence he would often raise his hand to his head, quite genteelly, for there is a proper way of doing these things, and scratch certain different places, as though they caused him temporary discomfort. You may imagine, then, how much Dixon disliked these summer exiles to the country. After three months, when they returned to town, it meant the addition of thirteen grey hairs at once, which, besides being an unlucky number, took at least two days to do, when he was compelled to wear his second best wig, which did not fit him at all. Then the whole world knew, so much of it as saw him, and it was not a great deal. For those two days, Dixon was as a sick man confined to his room. The whole household had been down on Dartmoor for a month, and Dixon was becoming reconciled to the discomfort of injured vanity, vanity injured by the knowledge that his wig had not received all the attention that it required. Sir Harold and his wife dined alone every night, except when there were visitors. The children were always sent to bed. Dixon stood there in the deep shadows of that old dining-room while they solemnly pursued the six courses of a somewhat elaborate dinner, sometimes almost in silence. Dixon had nothing to say against the dullness of this proceeding. He liked those deep shadows. Anyone coming into the room now, he would say to himself as he stood there, would think to themselves, what a decent head of air that chap has. Vanity in contemplation draws all eyes upon itself. Taking the visitor's regard of him for granted, this most likely would have been true. It is far more likely, however, that the attention of anyone entering that old dining room at such a moment would have been attracted to the four Queen Anne silver candlesticks, with their soft pink shades, in the centre of the small dining table they used on these occasions he would have observed the four old silver snuff-boxes on the centre of that table, placed there for ornamentation alone. And if he were a connoisseur, he would have noticed the spoons and forks, shining their reflections in the polished mahogany surface, all Queen Anne silver, every one of them Queen Anne. This was Sir Harold's hobby. It was one evening, on an occasion ever to be remembered by Dixon, that they sat alone at dinner together, and for the first two courses never spoke a word. It was, he would have told you, as he was serving the entree, that a sound in the far distance across the moor fell upon all their ears. Dixon paused as he handed the cutlets in aspic to his master. 
in the whole course of his experience as a butler this was the first time he had known his attention to be distracted from his work but the sound reaching them was such that in the silence of that old house far away on those lonely moors the mind of any man would have been arrested they all raised their heads to listen the silver entree dish with the cutlets in aspic was drooping lower and lower in dixon's hand with this unexpected abstraction of his mind another instant and the cutlets would have gracefully dropped to the floor when sir harold said what's that dixon dixon recovered his equilibrium in time saving the cutlets and not a moment too soon it was a gun sir he had no sooner said it than another sound trembled across the silence faintly shaking the windows in their sashes is it a convict escaped harold asked lady borthwick must be said he the devil's got off i don't know how the deuce they do it when you look at that place looks impossible to the outsider that any one could ever get clear poor wretched man said lady borthwick beginning slowly upon her cutlet one can't help feeling sorry for him it's safe to feel sorry at this distance replied her husband it can't do you any harm and doesn't do him much good no but i would help him if i could you'd help him the whole dignity of citizenship took umbrage at that but he's a criminal you can't help a criminal that's a criminal offence in itself you'd be an accessory after the fact i don't know what that means replied lady borthwick legal jargon never impresses me but supposing the man were a friend of one's own do you mean to say it would be a criminal act to help him when he was in trouble of course it would replied sir harold emphatically then i think the law's very silly said she not nearly so silly my dear as your suggestion that he might be a friend how could a man like that possibly be a friend of ours she was ready enough with her answer she referred him to lord william pentland the second son of one of the oldest families in the country he's serving his time now said she for that emerald necklace he stole willie can't help it he's a thief by nature he has that craving for other people's valuables which we've all got the only difference is he's more candid about it he admits it by taking them you can't call him anything else but a criminal and he's certainly a friend of ours if sir harold could have brought himself to deny a friendship with the pentland family he would have done it then and there finding that quite impossible especially before dixon he said nothing this was the most interesting discussion dixon had listened to at that table for some time he was of the opinion himself that it all depended upon how dangerous the man was if he was dangerous dixon would have helped him to escape accessory or no accessory a whole skin in dixon's opinion was well worth having well wouldn't you help lord willie asked lady borthwick pursuing her advantage no replied sir harold i'm an english citizen and as such am conscious of the duties incumbent upon me i hope that i should consider my country and the society in which i live before all such personal matters as friendship these were the sentiments of a man comfortably enjoying his dinner his cutlet in aspic was extremely tender the cold peas with it were very tasty indeed a mood of patriotism was their proper accompaniment all these little luxuries he owed to the fact that he was an englishman a knight and a successful man of business in the capital of that country to which he belonged then you mean to say said she you wouldn't help him i should do my duty he replied evasively and at that moment the bell at the hall door rang violently through the silence of the house at such a moment and with such a discussion in progress it was scarcely to be wondered at that all their hearts dixon's as much as any one's trembled in their breasts like weights suspended from a slender wire and then set off to beating each its liveliest tattoo who can that be sir harold inquired i don't know sir 
It might be anyone, he thought, and preferred to stay where he was. You'd better go and see, said Sir Harold, and as the bell rang out again, Dixon, with some reluctance, left the room. Sir Harold and his wife sat listening for the sounds in the hall. They said nothing. Their heads were turned slightly on one side as they strained to hear the faintest sound which could give them any suggestion of what was taking place outside. For the same thought had come, insistent and importunate, to both their minds. It had something to do with the escape of the convict from Princetown. They felt sure of that. Either it was the warders in pursuit, or, resultant upon their conversation but a few moments before, they imagined it might even be the convict himself. It was known to have happened before. Quiet householders had been disturbed at night by desperate men fleeing from justice. Well, Sir Harold knew what he would do, but he made just such a provision in his mind as Dixon had done. The man must not be too desperate or too dangerous. There were limits to one's sense of duty as a citizen. Neither of them, however, was prepared for what was to follow, for the door opened, revealing Dixon's blanched face and frightened eyes, while behind him they could see the close-cropped head of the escaped convict in all his prison clothes. Sir Harold rose with a blustering show of English indignation as the man pushed his way into the room. Then he stood back, leaning for support upon the table. "'Lord Willie!' he exclaimed. "'He would come in, sir,' said Dixon. "'I couldn't stop him. Says he knows you.' "'Quite correct,' said Lord William, affably. Then he bowed to Lady Borthwick. "'Lady Borthwick,' said he, "'if there were time to apologise, I would. "'The self-invited guest ought at least to come to the feast decently dressed. "'Circumstances would not permit that. I'm in a hurry.' "'What's happened?' asked Sir Harold. Well, I've just left my friends at Princetown, and they like my company, apparently. They want to have me back. They're remarkably hospitable in that way, but I've got other business to transact. The lightness of his manner suddenly changed. What can you do for me, Borthwick? I've got to get out of these clothes. You can lend me a suit. What's it to be? They may be here any minute. They're on my tracks already. They'll have found out I came this way. In a quarter of an hour they may be knocking at the door. Come on, man, come on. You must help me somehow or other. The suit's all right. Give me a dress suit if you've got a spare one by you. I always keep two suits, said Sir Harold. It was not a promise that he would let him have one but it was an opportunity of showing Lord Willie that he could afford to do himself well. All right, then. But on second thoughts, it had better be an ordinary lounge suit. I can be having dinner here with you dressed like that, can't I? But it's my cropped head. That's what I'm thinking about. How am I going to get over that? He looked desperately at them both, and they, as was only natural, the same thought occurring to both their minds, turned round and looked at Dixon. In nervous apprehension, Dixon's hand went swiftly to his head. "'Can't dine in a hat, can I?' said Lord Willie. "'Course I can't. They twig that at once. "'What are you looking at him for?' "'By Jove! You don't mean to say—' He hurried across to Dixon and peered into his head. "'It's not a wig, is it?' For Dixon's sake they both kept silent. The situation was becoming painful, as well as unpleasant. It was up to Dixon to admit it. "'Lord William is waiting for an answer, Dixon,' said Sir Harold, and then the wretched man, so prompted by his master, and seeing the look of desperation in Lord William's eyes, confessed the truth. Lord William turned round with a smile of relief. "'It's a simple matter, then,' said he. "'I beg pardon, my lord,' Dixon interposed. "'I said it's a simple matter,' Lord William repeated. "'Your wig, a suit of clothes, sitting quietly at dinner here. "'There's not a single one of them who'd believe it possible. "'I'd never counted on as much luck as this. "'But come along, we've got to be sharp about it. 
Just let's try it on now. It ought to fit. Well enough, anyhow. Here Lady Borthwick interposed. But he can't, she exclaimed. Poor Dixon, it's really... This was womanly sympathy. She could imagine how he would feel. The best of woman's vanity is that they can sympathise with the vanity of others. The worst of men's vanity, that they can't. Sir Harold pooh-poohed this nonsense about Dixon's feelings. When the warders come, said Lord Willie, he'll feel a good deal more comfortable without his wig than I shall with it. Quite so, said Sir Harold. For the time being he must put up with the discomfort. Everyone in the house knows you've got a wig, Dixon. Come now, take it off and give it to Lord William at once. Lady Borthwick looked her amazement. Well, you surprise me, Harold, said she, especially after what we were saying a few moments ago. Lord Willie regarded her with the most attractive expression in the world. It was everywhere admitted that he was a most fascinating creature when he liked, despite his little failing. My dear Lady Borthwick, said he, believe me, I am suffering a greater inconvenience in these than the good Dixon. He spread out his arms, the better to expose his prison garb. They are not becoming, Lady Borthwick. Our tailor over there doesn't make too well. Then again his manner changed. Time was slipping by, and his was a desperate need. A glance from his eye was enough to convince the timid Dixon that this was not a man to be played with. With infinite care he took the wig from his head, revealing that pathetically bald cranium which none of them in that house had ever seen before. "'I'm not sure,' said Lord Willie, as he put it on, "'that Dixon doesn't look better without it. "'Now, isn't that all right?' He turned for them to see. "'Not a bad fit at all,' replied Sir Harold. "'It makes a tremendous difference. "'Now you'd better go up with Dixon to my room and get that suit.' When you've given it to his lordship, Dixon, just come down here as quick as you can and lay another place. The wretched man was only too glad to disappear from the room. With a graceful bow to Lady Borthwick, begging them to waive ceremony and not wait for him, Lord Willie followed Dixon at once. Well, said Lady Borthwick, as soon as the door had closed, after all you've said, your talk about duty and citizenship, and all that nonsense. What would you have me do? asked her husband. Do? Why, let him find his own way out. You're a watcher may call it after the fact now. You've become a criminal yourself. Upon my soul, retorted Sir Harold. If anyone's gone back on their word, sure it's yourself. After all your talk about friendship, brave words I've no doubt, but they don't come to much. "'Well, you don't call a man like that a friend, do you?' said she. "'He steals everything that takes his fancy. "'He's the second son of the Earl of Godstow. "'You must remember that. "'One of the oldest families in England,' replied Sir Harold. "'I have no doubt his father will be very grateful to me when he hears.' "'Grateful? "'I should think the old man would much sooner have him out of harm's way in Princetown. "'It's the right place for him.' I think you're acting in a most quixotic and ridiculous way. We may get into most terrible trouble over this. I take it that this is the full value of your friendship, said her husband hotly. I can only suppose, she retaliated, that this is what you consider to be the duty of a citizen to the community at large. Here was excellent material for a lively domestic quarrel. There is no knowing what might not have been said. But at that moment, Dixon, thoroughly ashamed, thoroughly uncomfortable, entered the room. Their voices fell to silence as he laid another place. "'He'll be recognised,' said Lady Borthwick presently, "'and then we shall be in a nice fix. "'What's the sentence for being a thingy-me-bob after the fact?' "'I don't think he will be recognised, my lady,' interposed Dixon. "'He's got a moustache with him that he says he's been making.' Secret, of course. These last few months he's been in that place over there. He's always contemplated getting off, 
so he told me. Probably the warders won't come here at all, said Sir Harold. Then he can get away tomorrow in his disguise, and we shan't hear anything more about it. He won't get away in my wig, sir, said Dixon, firmly. He won't get away in that. Well, Dixon, if it's made worth your while, we shall see. I shall tell the Earl about your generosity myself. Dixon had many more protestations to make. One's own dignity is more valuable than the gratitude of an Earl. He was just about to say as much when the door opened and Lord Willie, another creature, entered the room. Mr. Stevenson, said he, and very pleased indeed, I may tell you, to accept your generous hospitality. Upon my soul, it's marvellous, exclaimed Sir Harold, but said no more. Once again the bell had clanged through the silence of the house. For one instant they all listened to it. Then Lord Willie was the first to act. He took his seat at once at the table. Go to the door, Dixon, said he. Let them in if they must come in, and come as naturally as you can and tell Sir Harold what it is. Trembling for the issue, Dixon went. He was no good for this sort of play-acting, he told himself. In the dining-room they would have sat and listened as they did before, but Lord Willie started upon a flow of conversation. "'I've been abroad,' said he. "'India, in the civil service. "'What's Bond Street like these days? "'I was forgetting. "'I haven't seen it for six months.' The door opened. This time it was Dixon who was in the background. His bald head shone out of the darkness. Before him stood one of the Prince Town warders in his sombre uniform. "'I am sorry to intrude at your dinner hour, Sir Harold,' he said. "'But I suppose you've heard the guns. "'One of the convicts has got away. "'We're scattering all over the moor. "'I've been round the garden already, "'but I think I must ask you to let me have a look through the house. "'There's no knowing where these fellows will hide. "'They get desperate once they taste freedom.' Can I go through the house now? Sir Harold rose to his feet. Lord Willie, seated with his back to the door, half turned in his chair, an interested listener. I'll take you myself, said Sir Harold. Of course, he might have got in by one of the windows, though it's hardly likely. They're all locked up at this time. Will you excuse me, Stevenson? Certainly, my dear fellow, certainly. Lord Willie replied, in a deep voice. Would you like me to come with you? No, no. You go on with your dinner. He turned to the warder. Will you come this way? So little could the man believe that convict 716 was under his very eyes that he paid no attention to Sir Harold's guest and followed him out of the room. The moment they were gone, Lord Willie leant back in his chair and laughed. Astute fellows, said he. He'll rummage through all your rooms till he's tired. He won't go to my bedroom, will he? said Lady Borthwick. Oh, won't he? He'll hunt everywhere. She jumped to her feet. I'm not going to have him rummaging through my bedroom, said she, with righteous indignation. I'll soon put a stop to that. There is a limit to friendship. She went to put a stop to it, without a moment's delay. The instant the door had closed, Lord Willie looked across at Dixon, standing there as far in the shadow of the corner as he could. Dixon, said he, sharply, how did that warder come? Was he walking? No, my lord, he was on a bicycle. Good, he rose quickly to his feet. Where did he leave it? Just outside the door, my lord. Good again. He's a thoughtful fellow. Now, Dixon, if it's known that your master has been shielding me, he may get into trouble. You might get into trouble, Dixon, for lending me your wig. Wouldn't be no fault of mine, my lord, said Dixon quickly. I wasn't allowed to do nothing else, not to say aloud. Quite so. But the law is peculiar in these matters, Dixon. It has no sentiments. Now, I want to save your master from trouble, and I want to save you. 
First of all, we'll suppose that while they've been upstairs, the escaped convict has got into the house, through the window. The hall door is still open, my lord. Through the hall door, then. Excellent. He's a desperate man, Dixon. He wants money. He... Yes, he sees this silver on the table. Lord Willie examined it, picked up one of the candles, and looked with the eye of one who appreciates at the hallmark. Beautiful silver, this, Dixon. Queen Anne, sir. Ah, worth a lot of money. All the better. He takes the silver. What am I doing all this time, my lord? inquired Dixon, who, as the case was only suppositious, presumed that he would be displaying some sort of courage. You are covered by a revolver in the convict's hand. You have no option but to do as he tells you. How about the other gentleman, my lord? Lord, yes, I'd forgotten him. He must have followed Lady Borthwick upstairs. But that warder took so little notice, Dixon, I think he won't even ask about him. Well, as I said, he takes the silver. He puts the room in darkness, he gets the warder's bicycle, and he's off, with the silver in his pocket. Beautiful silver this is, three-pronged forks. All Queen Anne, my lord. Beautiful. Now, out with those electric lights. I'll blow out these candles. Then I'll hide the silver under the table. They won't think of looking for it there, or looking for it at all. The warder will be after me. They'll never know the story isn't true, and I shall be out of the country in these clothes by tomorrow morning. He blew out the candles. Now the electric light. Dixon obeyed. The room was in utter darkness. In that sudden transition of light, the butler could see nothing. Lord Willie still continued his flow of conversation. Now I'm hiding the silver under the table, said he, but as soon as I go and you hear the hall door bang, you switch up the lights and call for help. They can't catch me then. I shall have a disguise. I shall have a bicycle. I shall have two minutes start of them. A thought suddenly occurred to him. Sir Harold hasn't got a car here, has he? Well, he has, my lord, but it's gone to Exeter for repairs. It comes back the day after tomorrow. Well, a bicycle's better than nothing. But how about my wig, my lord? Dixon, you must take my word for it that you shall have it back by post the moment I'm out of the country. I can't do better than that. Now, I've hidden all the silver. I'm off now, and as soon as you hear the door bang, up with the lights and call for help. Dixon waited in the darkness. His mind was so confused, he had no time to reason all these things out. It seemed a good scheme to him. The hall door banged. Even the windows rattled in their sashes. He switched on the lights, calling, Help! Help! Then he looked about him, peered under the table to see that the silver was well hidden away, with no likelihood of discovery. There was no silver. With the exception of the candlesticks, it was gone. Snuff-boxes, spoons and forks. All gone. And his wig! Help! he yelled. Help! End of Accessories After the Fact by E. Temple Thurston